Good afternoon and welcome to the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series hosted by the Southern IPM Center and sponsored by University of Florida, Texas AgriLife Extension, Auburn University, and University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. Today we are proud to present Rebecca Jordy and Tina Gordon talking about the First Coast Invasives Working Group, the role of master gardeners. Welcome everybody, my name is Rebecca Jordy and I'm going to give you a short history on extension just in case you weren't aware of it. I can't stand it, I have to. But throughout the United States there are land grant universities, Cornell, Rutgers, Texas A&M, Ohio State, Auburn, Georgia, University of Florida. What happened was the federal government granted us the land and said build your universities, do your research, but get it out to the public. Well how do they do that? Well, they take their faculty and they loan us or extend us to the counties or the parishes and therefore we're called extension educators or extension agents and that's where we started in 1915 by the way um, that's when extension came into existence and here in Nassau specifically we'll be celebrating our hundred years I wanted to talk today about um, part of what we're doing at the University of Florida and working with local government and with um, yards to parks um, I put up um, a couple of photos, I know that they're going to be familiar to you, but as we started this program I realized that it wasn't going to be as easy as I thought and I had a few obstacles I wanted to discuss with you and I'm sure you've experienced this too, but we want to talk about what we've done to help sort of overcome those obstacles. The first one was we realized we needed an accurate definition of what an invasive is. We were going on the premise of the fact that the invasives would go from a home situation into a park or con uh, conservation area and become a problem in wildlife um, areas. Well, when we talked about that, we started getting some feedback from people saying, well, hey, it's not a problem in my yard, so I don't really see this as an invasive problem. So if it's not a problem in my yard, it's not invasive. So we have to refer back again to the definition. Another thing is in these large subdivisions where there are hundreds of homes, they're nowhere near a park and so their attitude often was, well why should I care about, care about a wooded area hundreds or miles away from my home when it seems this particular plant behaves itself quite well in my you know, situation or in my subdivision. The other obstacle was that sometimes there's confusion between something that's weedy and something that's invasive. So some of our plants that are native have gotten a pretty bad rap because they are weedy. For instance, Mylax, um, the Muscadine, Wild Muscadine Grape, or even Carolina Jasmine. They get weedy, they climb on trees, people aren't happy with them, but that doesn't really mean they're invasive. Some of the other obstacles uh, are some misinformation about how to identify whether the plant really is invasive. For instance, Lantana, Boston Fern, Mexican Petunia. And Tina will be talking a little more about that. And the hybridization of these invasive plants. Now I want you to pay attention, if you can look at this photo that's in front of you, which I have of Lantana, look at the picture at the bottom of the leaf, which is about 6 o'clock. If you'll notice where the leaf is attached to the stem and it's truncated or squared, that shows us that this particular plant is a hybrid form. It may or may not be invasive or be fruiting, but this one in particular is. So looking for those kind of signs helps us identify whether this plant's going to possibly be a problem for us. Some other obstacles, people actually told us, look, this is part of evolution. We brought the plant in, it was brought here by animals or wind or whatever. This is survival of the fittest, too bad. I actually had some people tell me, look, you're a waste of tax dollar money. You're spending your time uh, on a useless uh, endeavor. Um, you're trying to push toothpaste back in the tube. And I was a little astounded at that attitude, but nevertheless, I want to point out that sometimes when we're in the field, we get this kind of pushback um, from them disagreeing with us selecting um, plants and pulling some out. You can see that this particular picture I had a skunk vine, and this area looks very similar to what happened with a 300 acre um, conservation area we have called Egan's Creek. We couldn't even see the trees, it was covered up so, so badly. Um, sometimes these cleanup efforts uh, just seem too difficult. The job is just way too big. We don't know where to go with it. But even though the job is too huge, start somewhere. 
Some other obstacles is that, well, invasive plants actually can have some benefits. They provide food, like this Chinese tallow. These three little seeds you see are, have a great germination rate, unfortunately, but they do provide fee, uh, food for birds, which in turn take it to other areas. Uh, some of the plants were brought in to help us with potential industry, like the tongue oil, camphor, paper mulberry. They weren't successful, but initially that was the reason we brought them in. So they did have a reason to have them here. Some other obstacles as well, we also brought them in to prevent erosion, which we know happened with kudzu, kogan grass, torpedo grass, beach vitex. All of those do the job, and unfortunately, they do it too successfully. We brought in uh, Brazilian pepper to dry up the uh, Everglade. That worked, but of course, it's so prolific, it's causing us incredible problems. The other obstacle that I ran into was that Sometimes these plants are just attractive to humans. They just have a beauty about them that makes us want to plant them and keep them around. Mexican petunia is one of those. The beach vitex, really attractive. The Brazilian pepper. Um, some of them give us great seasonal color, like the Chinese tallow. It looks so gorgeous next to the um, red maple that people want to keep it around, not to mention that beautiful heart-shaped leaf. Some other obstacles, again, the heart-shaped the heart -shaped leaf, this potato vine that we have that's causing us issues. People like it because of the shape. Alamo vine is another one, very variegated, attractive, has an almost lantern-like um, seed pot, very beautiful. Makes it difficult for people to want to get rid of because they're so attractive. One other uh, obstacle we came across was nostalgia. They have seen this plant growing when they were children. They remember, they have fond memories of it growing up a tree like this Chinese uh, wisteria, Japanese honeysuckle. And they have, it's very difficult for them to separate those memories and realize that this can change the ecosystem that they're around. And they don't want to remove it. Now, some parameters that we set for invasive control. Um, some things that we hope will happen. If the, as far as the public is concerned, if it's sold in the store, then it must be okay. So we need to change some of those behaviors, and that's what Tina's going to talk about too. And if it, um, it must not be an invasive um, uh, or a problem plant, of course, if it's sold locally, if I can get it. And then their real cry is, why doesn't the government do more things? Why isn't the government enforcing this, not realizing how that can be extremely costly? When we talked about earlier about the plant or the the uh, leaf shape, how attractive it is. See the Alamo vine right there. The flower is gorgeous on it. Makes it difficult for people want to want to get rid of. Now, some successes that we've had um, in education. One is the Yards to Parks, which is a really great program, and that really looks at taking a park and talking to the people that surround that park and let them know that what they do in their yards directly affects this park. And Egan's Creek is one of those for us. Fort Clinch is one of those for us. And the people are very aware of what a great prize they have, this jewel in their backyard, and they want to, they want to do what they can to protect it. So we've talked about giving um, Master Gardener training. The Master Gardeners, by the way, have been involved with me at, in three of my beaches. I have a historic, an African-American, historic African-American beach, which they go out with us, and we look for um, invasives, we identify them, and in some instances we remove them. We have two other beaches that we've actually dug plants up and cleaned them up. Um, on Egan's Creek, like I said, was 300 acres. We go and identify those plants, um, mark where they are, and let the city of Fernandina know that these are becoming a problem. We have HOA, um, Homeowner Association programs, where we go in and talk to large groups or the board and um, identify those plants that they really shouldn't be planting. And so the Florida Friendly Landscape helps us do that, where we can um, identify subdivisions or communities that will be gold or silver if they take or get rid of some of these invasives and do reduction of water and mulching, et cetera, and, and, and uh, use appropriate planting. Then we can give them those signet, um, indications that they are actually doing the right thing. That's the Florida Friendly Program. The Florida crash course in gardening I give, I always give a section on invasives, and the general public is very receptive to that, and it usually leads them into wanting to be certified in the Florida Friendly um, Program. We do newspaper articles and, of course, newsletter articles and workshops that continue on to try and educate. We realize that this is one of the most important things that we can be successful at, 
is letting the public know. Um, and whether we're addressing a large or small area, any effort is going to be important. The earlier we can catch it, the better. Even in those large infestations, um, like we had in Egan's Creek where the trees were to totally covered by skunk vines, once we started removing them, we saw a resurgence of wildflowers and vines. We saw that in every single place we went, those beach areas, in one of my situations, it was covered. It had 56, 55 gallon uh, tubs full of the um, Alamo vine once we removed it. And finally, we can see the resurgence back of some wildflowers and things we hadn't seen. In fact, I've been doing this for nine years. And this particular little guy came back this first year after we removed the skunk vine. This one's called a ground nut, and that was the first year that we've seen it. So I was very excited about how removing these bad guys really gives us an opportunity for the native plants to come back, which attracts native pollinators and bees, et cetera. So my other point is in success is no matter what effort, any effort is better than no effort. Um, this uh, this uh, planting natives or allowing natives to come back is going to outweigh any kind of invasive um, changes that were made. In fact, we can see within a short period of time, sometimes months, sometimes years, that it will return back to its original state. And it's so beautiful to see it. Uh, we've, found, we've seen Indian pink come back. They can plant um, oak leaf hydrangea, azaleas, muley grass, holly, red bug, magnolias. The list is very, very long on what they can use. Now, I put this, this photo so that you can see it. This is an American wisteria. And although you can see it's not the very long, long grape cluster, it's a very pretty cluster. And it attracts, again, our native pollinators. And um, I actually, this is from my yard. And uh, that's my photo. So where we need to work, we need to make more inroads with growers and retail stores um, so that we can reduce those sales of invasive plants. We know that what happens sometimes with these invasives is that they are placed in containers like hanging pots where so that makes them, quote, legal. Um, but at the same time, what happens is homeowner takes it home, he gets bored with it, he plants it in the ground, and it becomes prolific. We also need more accurate labeling with those plants that are truly native and those that are Florida friendly. There is some confusion, and Tina will talk about that too. We need more education to homeowner associations and homeowners so that they can really make a difference on and be a little more conscious about what they purchase and know that either it should be here or it shouldn't be here. And then we need to make some real um, strong inroads into getting plants listed on the noxious list or us just using that FLEPSI list. Of course, the FLEPSI list is the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Pest Control Council. And that one um, makes a real difference. We've been using it for a, a long period of time, and it's become really, really valuable to us. We need to make more inroads on making sure that those noxious weeds are on that list. And I think they've done a great job of doing that. I just wanted to let you know that the photos were supplied by the synthetic and invasive plants, and then some of these were my own. This is one of the wildflowers that we found back on the beach area once we got rid of the Alamo vine, and it was lovely to see it come back. And um, all right, that's all I have to say. Tina, are you ready to share? I am. While we're switching over, if you have for Rebecca or Tina, feel free to enter them into the panel on the right or on the panel for GoToWebinar, and we'll be getting those as soon as Tina's done. So now we have Tina Gordon. All right, um, so Rebecca asked me to join her on this webinar to give some of our successful programs and some of the things that we are doing uh, and share some of the challenges we have, which is very similar to a lot of the challenges that, that Rebecca spoke about previously. And I'll go a little more in-depth on some of those things. So one of our, um, oh, I, my program is with the GTM Research Reserve. That's the Guanatola Mato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, and I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator there. We're a part of the Department of Environmental Protection and NOAA. Um, so one of the programs that I feel has been most successful uh, started out as a small grant funded program. And it's our Brazilian pepper crew, or uh, we like to call them the pepper busters. And that's actually a volunteer uh, crew run through the GTM Research Reserve. And they go out and they identify areas of key concern 
uh, and they eradicate invasive species with particular focus on Brazilian pepper. Um, they also work on some other noxious plants. They are in their eighth or ninth year. It's uh, fully volunteer run, although GCM does supply um, some of the needed supplies, chainsaw train, chains, herbicide, those sort of things. And this crew works uh, essentially from Duval to Flagler County and occasionally up in Nassau. Uh, but that's a little far from us, but we, we have done some work there on large work days. And they spend one day um, every other week out at sites in Northeast Florida. Part of what I do is previous to sending them out there, I go and do site assessments with the owners um, or the land managers. Uh, we do work on public and private lands. So I go out there and work to identify what the problem areas are, uh, give some recommendations for uh, potentially replacing plants with native landscaping, um, and I also attend with the pepper busters during removal days quite often. Um, they are all chainsaw trained and certified through us. Um, uh, Phil and Gary have their herbicide certifications, uh, so they, they definitely know what they're doing. And uh, they're supervised by staff here. And that's been really successful in getting into a lot of these properties and really helping people with large problems. We don't usually go do single tree removals, um, but we do go into areas that have large infestations and schedule several work days. And then we do follow-up visits to do rechecks uh, for any new sprouts, anything coming back up. So we, we maintain a lot of various properties in St. Johns County. And we've seen great success, not just with removal, but with the reestablishment of natives after we do removal. The other large scale program that I do is a NatureWise workshop program. And I do that in two different ways. I do community work. Those uh, are working with HOAs, homeowners, condo associations, and real estate agents that manage various properties. Um, and we go out and we educate them on invasive plants, how to remove invasives. And we also, we don't want to keep it all on invasives. We try and put a positive spin with the, at least the community workshops. And we talk with them about native landscaping to promote wildlife and native alternatives to replace the invasives that they're removing. Nobody wants to remove something and have a big hole in their yard. So we definitely try and provide them with native alternatives that can kind of serve the same benefit. So we talk to them about what they like about the plant. Is it the structure? Is it the flower color? Um, is it the time that it fruits during the year? Is it that it's attracting a certain type of wildlife? And we work with them to find some alternatives to utilize in their landscaping that will replace those things. Um, topics we cover are pretty much Invasives 101, everything from the top, and then the native landscaping portion. Off of that community workshop, we ended up having a few industry people that attended some of these workshops and said, wow, you know, I'd really like something that's maybe a little bit more advanced for my stakeholder group. Do you think that you could do a workshop for us? So with that, we work with some large landowners, um, like pine plantations and things of that nature. Uh, we work with a lot of the municipalities on their county and city parks, as well as their utility easements. Um, we've worked with utility companies like FPL uh, on both technical assistance and providing them with these workshops. And uh, landscaping companies and some nurseries have attended as well, which is great. And one of the things that we really push during these workshops is the use of the FLEPSI list over the legislated list or the noxious weeds list. And I'll talk a little bit more about why, we, why that's our preference and why that's what we teach. So another thing that has been highly successful, um, in addition to my position as a Coast Training Program Coordinator, I'm also the co-chair of the First Coast Invasive Working Group. And we have worked over the past few years to um, do air potato roundups during National Invasive Species Awareness Week. And that really provides an opportunity for the public to get involved with invasive species removal and assist some of these large land areas um, or, and organizations with cleaning up air potato, which if you're familiar with, it's pretty much a manual removal process. 
So you have to collect the potatoes, um, you have to pull the vines, and there's a lot of work that goes in, into that. But with these large roundups, what we get are large teams of volunteers that go out to various sites, and that really can make an impact. Um, during our 2014 roundup last year, uh, we collected 9,257 pounds of air potato. Um, we had 254 volunteers at 12 different sites around the First Coast. Um, and with the air potato roundups, we also give prizes. So there's usually some donated prizes uh, from a couple of different kayak companies and ecotour companies. Um, and those go to the person that finds the largest potato. So this is a great event because it gets kids involved. And during the event, we have people tabling each of the events, site captains, and they also talk to people about some of the other invasives that they might see in their yards, some of the other invasives that they might see sold in stores, and some of the other things of concern. So they're not actively removing those, but at least we're getting the word out and we're taking that opportunity to educate. Um, and this is definitely an event where it is families, all ages, I've seen two-year-olds out there getting really excited and picking up potatoes. So it's a great event for public outreach. Um, some of the challenges with this, oh, sorry. Some of the challenges that I faced in my outreach um, are really the terminology. So one of the things is this Florida-friendly terminology, which is a great program that was started by IFAS to encourage uh, good landscaping habits and watering, uh, reduced use of fertilizer, right plant, right place, all of these wonderful things. But what's happened is the landscaping and horticultural industry has picked up this term, and they've pretty much used it at nurseries uh, to mean that a plant doesn't require a lot of fertilizer and it doesn't require extra watering. Unfortunately, those are also tendencies of invasive plants. So a lot of plants that can live anywhere, they survive under many different conditions, um, and they do very well without all of these extra things are also the things that we have to worry about when they escape into our natural areas. Uh, something that requires fertilizer or water escapes into a natural area, it's probably not going to do so good. So some of the things that we think of as great for landscaping can also be tendencies that we see in our invasive plants. And unfortunately, it's, this can be really misleading to consumers. So I've heard a lot of people go, well, what do you mean my Mexican petunia is invasive? It was labeled as Florida friendly. Doesn't, mean, doesn't that mean that it's good for the environment in Florida? And so this has there, there's nobody that's kind of monitoring the way these terminologies are used. It's not like you have to meet certain criteria to say this is Florida friendly. So in doing that, we, we confuse people a lot of times. And it's terrible because they think that what they're doing is the best thing. And they're saying, I'm doing a great job. I have all Florida friendly plants. And they don't realize that that doesn't cover things like how invasive is that plant? Is that plant going to escape cultivation? Um, so those are some of the concerns. And the Mexican petunia, the lantana, the asparagus fern, these are all things that I see regularly labeled as Florida friendly that we also consider invasive. Uh, another issue that we have, as Rebecca said, is the legislated list. So people say, well, why isn't this regulated then? If it's so terrible, if it's got such invasive tendencies, why isn't this regulated? It takes a long time to get something listed on the noxious weeds list, uh, whereas FLEPSI is updated every two years, um, and they have their own set of criteria that go by. And one of the things that FLEPSI goes by is those environmental impacts. And although that's included in things like the noxious weed list, does it have an environmental impact, a lot of times what they're really looking for are those economic impacts to the state. And that's how things get listed on the noxious weeds list. Uh, they affect navigation. Um, they affect agricultural crops. Things like that will get you listed on noxious weeds a lot faster than having to show the ecological impacts, because that's, a lot, that's more difficult to show oftentimes. So what we teach in our outreach is that people should really go by the FLEPSI list. And they should go by it not just under category one, which are those things that are already shown to be invasive and be causing serious issues, but they should also pay attention to category two, which are things that we are kind of watching to see what kind of impacts they're going to have. 
or maybe they just arrived here, but they've shown invasive tendencies on the West Coast. So if they're invasive over there, the likelihood is that they'll probably become invasive over here, and we need to keep an eye out for them. So those are the sort of outreach challenges that we have, is really explaining to people, I know these things are legislated, but maybe we should be looking at this other list that's a little more comprehensive. <clears throat> Another thing that we deal with as far as uh, major challenges in outreach and education is hybridization, and not just with invasives, but also with our native varieties. So um, we have, as, she, as Rebecca said, we have Lantana chimera, which we know is listed as invasive. Um, but there's a lot of people that sell Lantana that they say, mm, oh, this is not Lantana chimera, this is not invasive, um, and, and perhaps it isn't, but it might be a hybrid cultivar of Lantana chimera. We see that uh, quite often. And with all of these new cultivars, is that something that we need to worry about? Um, maybe it's not hybridized with Lantana chimera, but maybe it's still going to have invasive tendencies. There's also a lot of confusion over uh, the invasive. So a lot of people say, oh, well, I sell native Lantana. I personally am very reluctant to say, oh, that yes, that's, that's Lantana depressa or some other native variety, and, and even if it is, is it or is it not hybridized already with the invasive lantana? So those are some things that, to me, are very difficult and very challenging to explain to the public, um, and, and it's difficult when there are challenges within the nursery industry of where those fine lines are, especially with hybridization. So those are our primary challenges and our primary programs. Um, and that's, that's all I wanted to talk about. So I think we have plenty of time for questions. We do. We have plenty of time for questions. So if anyone wants to enter some into the chat section on the GoToWebinar control panel, we'll get to those. Um, I'll have a question to start us off. A lot of the efforts that you and Rebecca are working on um, are looking at volunteer participation for cleanup events. And for the Air Potato Roundup, you mentioned prizes and some other ways that you were incentivizing people to come out for that. How are you recruiting volunteers and maintaining their engagements with some of these activities? Rebecca, mm -hmm. do you want to start? Um, my master gardeners are the ones that are involved in, in my program. And so um, I just really... They they just are interested. They love it. They have a passion for it. So I don't even have to give them any, any incentives. Don't even tell them that you do that, Tina. I won't I won't share that with them. Um, <laughs> um, for them, it's just a matter of their own passion and them wanting to make a real difference in the community, their local community. So I don't I don't offer incentives. I just who wants to come comes. I, I leave it at that. Yeah, the Air Potato Roundup is uh, it, it's sponsored by our Invasive Working Group, and there is some incentive there to participate. Um, although after, out of 254 volunteers, knowing that you might possibly be one of two people that gets a free kayak tour, maybe not the highest rate of incentive there. Um, GTM actually has a huge volunteer base. Uh, we have tens of thousands of volunteer hours logged every year. Um, and we really try and match the volunteers that come into GTM with specific programs that will interest them and that will engage them and that are suited to uh, their desires as a volunteer and also their capabilities. So I think we have a, a really high retention rate of volunteers because we really put them in the right programs. So not all volunteers are well suited to pepper busting. Uh, it is definitely uh, labor of love out in the heat <laughs> working with chemicals and chainsaws, so it's not for everyone. But we have a lot of retirees that we've reached out to um, from the Forest Service, from the Park Service, that really just want to stay involved still. And they are, those tend to be the type of volunteers that we keep on our pepper busting crew because they, they have come out of those types of jobs and they really want to be out there. Um, but we kind of tailor our volunteer opportunities to those people. And I do volunteer recruitment pretty much every time I speak. I talk about the variety of programs we have and try and recruit volunteers at our talks. And that's been pretty successful as well. Okay. 
We have a question from Tanya Beard. Did you get or need to get governmental or bureaucratic support for proceeding with your programs? And if so, how did you do it? Um, I can speak for us. We, I mean, we are part of a government agency, but because these are mostly volunteer-led programs, um, we, we haven't really specifically asked for government support. Um, I have a budget. Some of that is allocated to uh, invasive controls. And because I'm partially funded by NOAA, that kind of opens me up to be able to work on a regional basis, um, or at least within our boundaries, which covers 74,000 acres. So that's a pretty expansive area for, for me to be able to work into. So I haven't had to explicitly ask for government support. Um, I know that all of our upper management that has come through and seen this in a lot of our other programs has always thought it was a wonderful program and, and has given me support from from the back end. But on the front of things, I haven't directly asked. As far as we're concerned with it, um, with Egan's Creek, it actually, funny story, um, they sent out bids to get somebody to come and identify the invasives at the four beaches, the three beaches, and the 300 acres. So we're much smaller than Tina's group. Um, and, and no one would bid on it. No one would take it because it was only $1,500. So the government called me. The city of Fernandina called me and said, would you be willing to do this? And it was, yeah, I'll put this in the Master Gardener program. We'll do it. It'll help them uh, um, with advanced training for them. And so it's a very small amount of money, but it helps them put money back into their program, which I have three demonstration gardens. And they've uh, fully funded by um, their efforts and their fundraising in addition to the city of Fernandina. So um, that's how I got into it. And, and as far as the municipal governments um, outside of my own agency, uh, we've definitely gotten a lot of support from St. John's County, City of St. Augustine. We're currently working with them on cleaning up all of their parks. Um, and, and I've gone through their land management departments or their environmental departments and just said, hey, you notice, I noticed you have a lot of these issues um, and perhaps you don't have the resources to address them right now. But we do have a volunteer crew. We have a little bit of resources. And, and you know, if we collaborate, I really feel like we can uh, make a dent in this. And I've spoken to uh, city and county commissioners through that process and have gotten um, full support. We're working very hard with St. John's County and City of St. Augustine right now to clear a lot of their public lands that are infested. Um, and they do help. They, they contribute something in either manpower, if they have it, uh, that's a lot of times where they're limited, or they can co contribute with disposal. So they'll come drop off big dumpsters for us or come by with the trucks with the big claw and, and unload all of our debris after we go through and clear an area. So it's been a, it's been a mutually beneficial partnership. Yeah. Well, and in terms of your other partnerships, you have one of the questions we have looks at that. Does the Master Gardener program in Florida ever partner with the USDA APHIS PPQ folks on invasive plants of common interest to both organizations? Absolutely. We all do throughout the state. In every single one of our counties, there's an interest from all of our volunteers, including the type of group that Tina has. Um, none of us can do this alone. And so absolutely we work in partnership, and it helps us um, because we really do feel like we're making some sort of of difference, and that's what keeps them going. They love to see, when you walk away from a site, and Tina will attest to this too, and you see that it's clean, and it is, and you think the four tons that you've taken away or the nine tons that you've taken away, it, yes, you made a difference. So they love it. Yeah, so there's an absolute partnership. And for, for us, we have, a, we have many different partnerships. Um, as I said before, I'm the co-chair of the First Coast Invasive Working Group. And so uh, even on agency land, um, a lot of times you can only have agency people. So we will organize um, work days through the CISMA for lands that maybe we can't put volunteers on. And we will go out there and assist on those lands. And it's mostly agency uh, people. And we have you know, Army Corps and Park, National Park Service, State Park Service, um, some of the zoos. So there's the, that's a huge collaboration and partnership effort. Right. As a government agency using volunteers, 
how do you manage the issues of liability? So uh, <laughs> for us, this has been run through our legal department, and they've said that um, as long as our volunteers are properly trained and certified, um, and as long as they are under the direction and they are within our boundaries, which as I said is 74,000 acres, um, and that boundary is not all land we directly manage, that encompasses some municipalities, um, it encompasses some state and national lands, and, and a ton of private property, more than we could probably ever treat. Um, as long as they're within GTM NER boundaries, they are covered under our liability insurance. The master gardeners are covered uh, also by the University of Florida, but I'm sort of the gatekeeper on what I will allow them to get themselves involved in. On Egan's Creek, the 300 acres city of Fernandina, um, it is so massive and so large that it, it required large equipment, uh, large spray, spray equipment, and I didn't have my master gardeners involved in that. In the small acreage beach areas, those three beaches, yes, we were we were actually going out there and we were digging and we were we were removing things. But um, so, like I said, I'm the gatekeeper, but it recovered by the University of Florida. Okay, um, we have one of our webinar participants is participating from outside of Florida, and they're asking how would we coordinate activities that encompass more than one state. Or are you doing that at this point? Yes. Um, interestingly enough, now in the United States this makes a difference. I'm not sure about international because that would be considered international if we talked about Canada. But we, um, our universities receive additional funding from the USDA when we partner with each other. And so because of that, it behooves us to partner with a multi-state. And certainly we do it with multi-county, but we certainly do it with multi-state too. So there is money to be had. It's not good, great money, but it is something. And there's an encouraging part from both our universities, whether we're statewide, you know, or all over the United States, to partner with each other. So that's an incentive. For us, we haven't done much out-of-state partnering, although um, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Our big restriction is travel. Um, but as far as providing materials, um, I've provided other CTP programs. There's 28 uh, National Estuarine Research Reserves around the country, and I've provided a lot of them with um, some of the training materials and workshop materials, PowerPoint presentations, and uh, some of the outreach uh, development that I've done in the past. Okay. It looks like at this time there are no more questions from the attendees. So I'd like to thank you all for attending the webinar as part of the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. This recording, as well as all the other recordings we've done of the webinars this week, will be available at youtube.com slash southern IPM center. Thank you for attending.